Hello and welcome to the Partners in Health webinar series. Uh, we're here again today to talk about our response to COVID and today's topic is the U.S. Public Health Accompaniment Unit Overview. And I have the great pleasure of sitting here virtually at least with four of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Sheila Davis, our Chief Executive Officer of Partners in Health, also Dr. Joya Mukherjee, who's our Chief Medical Officer, She's also an associate professor in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School, an associate professor in the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital. We also have Katie Bolbach, who is PIH's director of the U.S. Public Health Accompaniment Unit. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Ma uh, Anatol Manzi, who is the deputy chief medical officer in charge of clinical quality and health systems strengthening. So welcome to all four of you today. Um, we have a lot to, to cover and uh, Sheila will start us out and then pass uh, the baton on to, to Katie and, and Monzi and Joya will accompany us through our uh, Q&A section. So uh, just to uh, give you a, a little bit of an overview here for folks who are not completely used to using uh, Zoom yet, if you go up to the top of your screen, you'll see the view options. And uh, the best way to experience this is the side by, side by side mode. So go ahead and click that if you're not there already. And then if you go um, in between where you see the speakers and the presentation, the slides, you'll see that there's a little bar there. You can adjust um, left and right to increase the size of the actual presentation. Um, we will have this full video um, recording available on our website and out to anyone who's RSVP'd and there will also be slides available. So don't feel like you have to take copious notes. Um, everything will be available for you soon. So thank you everyone for tuning in. And without further ado, I want to hand over to Dr. Sheila Davis. Thanks, Sheila. Thanks, Leslie. Um, certainly wanted to thank everyone for taking the time today to log on and learn a little bit about our efforts. Um, and want to start with a little bit of history of how this all began. So we were asked by Governor Baker in Massachusetts, um, I think the beginning, um, it was announced, I think April 3rd, when the governor had a few weeks prior um, had asked a group of Massachusetts state agencies, such as the Mass um, Community Connector, the Department of Public Health, um, Partners in Health certainly and other um, mass entities to form the community um, contact tracing entity. And it um, came together very, very quickly. Um, Dr. Jim Kim, who is one of PIH's founders, was, was very instrumental in this, as was um, Joya, who you'll hear from later, and Dr. KJ Sung as well, who um, were part of the initial design of this uh, community tracing collaborative. And this um, collaborative, I think, was the first of its kind in Massachusetts, although contact tracing has happened within departments of public health for other infectious diseases for years, and I think there's 94 different um, uh, infectious diseases that are tracked in Massachusetts, for example, and there's 351 boards of health. They've all been working very hard, as had Department of Public Health around the country, to do contact tracing. The sheer volume of COVID obviously made that impossible. So this collaborative was stood up to support and be the, the army of the existing Department of Public Health um, and really augmented those teams and that expertise to be able to provide the boots on the ground in the terms of the phone calls on the ground um, to reach out to people who were tested positive for COVID and then do the contact tracing to find out who they um, had been in contact with. The goal of contact tracing obviously is to stop transmission of the virus. So the whole point, which included having um, a massive um, a PR campaign to have people understand to pick up the phone. So there was, there was a, a, an effort from every different part of Partners in Health, certainly and many partners within the state of Massachusetts to stand this up. And we hired about 1,900 people very quickly for short-term positions to become our contact tracers as well as our case investigators who are the people who spend the one-on-one -on -one time, um, most of the time on the phone, 
um, with people who have tested positive to find out how they're feeling. Do they need um, extra social support if they needed to isolate or uh, be away from their families? Do they need special assistance to make that happen, such as food or a safe place to isolate? So these contact tracers, as well as community resource coordinators, who are the people who actually would then um, connect people to care um, with food with food pantries and uh, transportation, et cetera, was a kind of an entire team that worked together to do this. Um, the, the goal is, is certainly to reach people and um, that's all done by phone or by text. Um, and we've made over 300,000 calls that this, this CTC has, which is pretty amazing. Um, if we're not able to get in touch with people, then those cases or cases that may have some complexity stay within the local boards of health who are certainly the, the experts in caring for their, their communities. So when this launched in, in April, there was obviously an onslaught of attention and, and people wanting to learn more about this. And Joya and I and others talked to so many different states and entities of people reaching out saying, um, can you help us uh, do this in, in our own local state or area? And um, because we wanted to be able to take the lessons learned from global PIH from what we learned in Massachusetts, as well as our 11 countries around the world, um, the, the, the goal was to be able to do that and not have to have it dependent on each state um, contracting with partners in health the public health accompaniment unit was launched. Next slide. So the, the goal of this is, is to really go where we're needed and our focus is the most vulnerable communities. And so we've, this, the first country, the first states and, and municipalities that were helped, I'll let Katie Balbeck talk about in more depth. But our, our goal is definitely to bring the essence of PIH, which is, is caring for those who um, are typically have, have suffer disproportionately from infections like COVID, from poverty, from lack of resources. So we're, we're wanting to, to take the you know, mission of Partners in Health to our U.S. Uh, partners as well and learn also from what's happening here in the U.S. and in many really strong public health efforts and also see where maybe there's cracks in the system of where a different comprehensive model of care of that, what we've learned from Rwanda and other countries, we could also bring those important strategies here to the US. So this, um, this new unit was launched um, just not, not too long ago. And certainly we've learned a tremendous amount and, and continue to have our um, colleagues from around the world weigh in and, and help us think through this, the problems and some of the issues that we're facing here. I'm gonna pass this now to Katie Balbeck, who um, will be giving some more details on this special unit. Thank you. Great, thanks Sheila. Hi all. Um, so excited to share a bit more about kind of how we've taken up uh, that uh, outreach and, and request for support from other partners around the country um, to, to kind of build out this team that, that is now ramping up uh, advising, learning spaces and some broader advocacy and communications efforts uh, to, to strengthen the, the national US COVID response. So um, we've had a couple of goals in building out this work as Sheila um, outlined. The first is to help other states, cities, communities rapidly scale up contact tracing um, and to really accelerate the speed and uh, ability to get to scale required. Uh, as Sheila said, you know, we have tremendous colleagues in departments of health across the country who've been doing this work for years, but have just been overwhelmed um, by the unprecedented scale of COVID and, and the requirements that have come along with that. Uh, and so the first goal we've set out is really to help others rapidly uh, accelerate implementation of contact tracing. Um, second, really expanding a focus on the most vulnerable in these efforts. Um, we feel really strongly contact tracing can't be uh, an epidemiologic data collection exercise. It's really about connection to care and coordination of care for those most in need um, to ensure uh, that all are able to isolate or quarantine safely and to help break those chains of transmission. Um, and then lastly, you know, trying to connect this to a broader 
agenda and set of work around health system strengthening here in the US, um, you know, as we've seen in our work in West Africa on Ebola and other emergency epidemic response around the world. Um, there's often a need to respond to an acute epidemic crisis, um, but that the root causes of that really lay in underfunded and fragmented health systems that require broader investment and rebuilding to help avoid a next outbreak epidemic pandemic. Um, and so uh, you can see on the slide here, we're translating that into kind of three core areas of work for our unit and our team. Uh, the first is technical advising services. So we built out a team of advisors who are accompanying other states, cities, and communities in ramping up their contact tracing efforts and broader COVID response, COVID, broader community COVID response efforts in some cases. Um, the second piece is a learning collaborative, which uh, Manzi will speak more about in a moment, but which is uh, a, both an online resource library, but also a community of practice, a convening space for frontline implementers uh, to connect, to share best practices in real time, and to help improve the quality of our overall response um, and accelerate adoption of best practices across the country. And then uh, kind of in a cross-cutting way, we're looking as well at, you know, what are we learning in our direct implementation work in Massachusetts, in our advising in states and cities across the country through this learning collaborative network that can help inform this broader effort um, to advocate for the right to health, for deeper investment uh, in health systems, in public health in the United States and, and more broadly. Um, so you go, go to next slide. So I'll speak briefly to the, the first component of this, which is our technical advising work. Um, so we've built out a team of, of a lot of PIH alumni from our global uh, infectious disease and epidemic response work around the world and other like-minded colleagues um, and, and experts who uh, have, have jumped in over the last six weeks, we're about six weeks into this um, team and process uh, to, to help uh, work alongside and accompany uh, colleagues in the in the departments of health um, at a state level, at a city level, and in some cases at a community level. Um, and you know, as Sheila said, we're bringing the same focus and values and mission to this work as we do to all of our work at PIH, which is first of all a preferential option for the poor, and really preferentially providing our advising support and services um, to places that have been hardest hit, um, most under resourced, um, have you know, disproportionate impact in communities of color, um, indigenous communities, uh, you know, others who have been made most vulnerable due to broader social determinants of health and, and uh, under-resourced and inequitable health system. So um, we've, we've focused, this is our first set of six um, partners that we've been working with over the last few weeks in these efforts. Um, we've in some places taken what we're calling a deep dive accompaniment approach, which is where we're, uh, allocating a team of uh, up to four or five advisors who are being seconded full-time alongside Department of Health colleagues um, to help co-design contact tracing efforts to really run alongside implementation and kind of really be in it um, with our partners. Um, and so started uh, our first set of work in, in the city of Newark, New Jersey with the Department of Health, Mayor's Office, and a great partner called Newark Alliance. There um, have extended our long relationship with Navajo Nation and PIH's work there and uh, are supporting a broader ramp up um, in those communities and uh, also a, a small uh, community in, in southern Florida that is um, largely comprised of migrant workers and farm workers in Immokalee um, has been our sort of deep dive uh, commitments thus far and, our, and then taken a lighter touch approach where we're working with um, uh, state governments or kind of other partners uh, in, a, in a, a lighter touch way in Ohio, North Carolina, Illinois, where we have um, advisors on call and available to provide resources, materials, lessons learned, connect to our network of implementers and advisors in Massachusetts and globally um, who can help be thought partners and troubleshoot issues as they come up. Um, and this advising has really ranged across um, you know, there's many component parts required to build an equitable and effective contact tracing program. So this can range from advising on workforce development, you know, how do you recruit, train, and manage and sustain a surge um, staffing force? 
How do you build the technology required to help capture the data needed to, to track cases, contacts, and, um, and safe isolation and quarantine referrals? Uh, the most critical care coordination piece that Sheila highlighted at the beginning about ensuring that there are referrals to social supports and safety net services um, to support those uh, who need them and communications and marketing, evaluation, KPIs, dashboards. Um, we've kind of covered the breadth of what it requires and looking kind of across the system as, at what is needed. So um, have, a, have a great team of advisors who have started to ramp up this work in these six sites and are working on formalizing a next set of um, partnership commitments where we'll be seconding advisors in the coming weeks. Um, but I'll leave it at that for our technical advising piece. I want to turn it over to Manzi, who can share a bit more about the learning collaborative element of our public health accompaniment unit. Thanks, Katie. Uh, I just want to say that really learning and sharing uh, practices are important pillars of public health response to pandemics. Uh, and again, what I mean here is that containing COVID-19 is a function of how soon we get all stakeholders and share best practices. You know, do, people do not have to reinvent the wheel, uh, but it's, only, it's not only best practices, it's also uh, what's not working? What are the worst uh, practices do we have so people you know, do not have to repeat them? So we will be launching a, an applied learning collaborative. And here what I mean is really a model that consists in sharing uh, practical lessons and tools, you know, with, you know, really basic evidence-based pra practices that people can replicate in their own settings. This approach creates a, a space for implementers and other stakeholders to engage and engineer solutions, innovative solutions to stop COVID-19 and its impact. So we will be launching our learning series. The first learning session will be uh, taking place on June 23rd and our amazing technical advisors and catalysts will be there present. And this community of practice, you know, is very critical for us to stop uh, COVID-19, but also start thinking about how do we support a health system's resilience and recovery. So uh, we, we really want to make it easier for people to access the tools. Um, so for that to happen, we just built a, a resource uh, library, which is now uh, ready. And we will be launching this series for everyone to come and share and learn. So uh, this is really an exciting opportunity uh, open to everyone. And we really uh, look forward to you know, uh, working closely with all these states uh, and municipalities and you know, really everyone coming and contribute to this effort to uh, stop COVID-19. So I look forward to you know, discussing more and sharing uh, with everyone here today. Great, thank you very much to Sheila and Katie and, and Monzi for this wonderful introduction. And I already see a, a long list of questions uh, coming in through chat. Uh, so please feel free to add questions that you have. We do have some uh, great uh, questions that were submitted beforehand. So I, I'll, I'll get to those first and then um, uh, go through the other burning questions that our listeners and watchers have. So I think the first question, Sheila, I will put to you, um, and this was pre-submitted, how, how can PIH help uh, more US states, especially now that the contact tracing challenge is so daunting? Um, and maybe combined with that, I saw another question coming through the, the chat, you know, how do we choose these partnerships? So how can we help more places and how do we choose who to go with? Yeah, thanks, Leslie. I think the, you know, I think there's a few ways. Um, if a state or um, a city or municipality is interested in PIH helping, there is an email address of, of tainfo at pih.org which is a place where you can send an email to um, reach out and, and have a conversation with Katie or others on that team to see if, if working more closely and um, having partners in health help um, on a more um, a comprehensive way is something you want to explore. Also, the learning collaborative that Monty was just describing, I think is, is such a great way for 
uh, to be a convener for people who are learning so much about this all across in different states to be able to share with each other. I think we learned a lot from working in Massachusetts, just as we've learned a lot working all over the world. But there's also people learning quite a bit in, in, in many other efforts in states and cities around the country right now. So I, I think on a larger scale, the Learning Collaborative is a great way to learn, but also to share your what you're learning and your experiences. And then if you're interested in NPIH working more closely, um, then definitely reach out to that at tainfo at pih.org and we can have a further conversation with you to talk about whether that could work. Great. Uh, and I am going to do the same uh, thing and combining a chat, a live chat with a pre-submitted question, but for Joya this time. Uh, Joya, welcome to the conversation. Um, and you know, maybe some people are just hearing about us for the first time, right? Partners in Health might mm -hmm. just have come into their lexicon because of our US work. But you know, where else do we have the experience with public health accompaniment you know, using this model? And I saw someone ask if the same collaborative approach is, is working in Haiti for our response there. Yeah, so thanks for that question. And also thanks for the opportunity to, to talk to all of you about what we do at Partners in Health. So we have long believed Partners in Health is a 35-year-old organization. Um, we have a staff of 17,000 around the world, and 98% of them are local to the countries in which they work. And so um, we believe that human rights, health as a human right has two parts. One is the engagement of the community, like we're doing with the Community Tracing uh, Collaborative, but also to support governments to do the right thing and to be able to deliver. And so in every country we work, and we work in 11 around the world, we work with the local public health departments um, in care delivery and contact tracing and following up patients that have um, you know, chronic problems. So this approach of public health accompaniment is central to what we do. And that's why we felt um, honored by the government, governor's request in Massachusetts, but we felt that we could do it because we're familiar with working with our counterparts in the Department of Public Health around the world. So this is how we echo and amplify and help them to expand the reach that they should have and already may have, but may not have the manpower to do it. Great, um, thank you. Uh, and one other maybe question I'll, I'll send to you too, Joya, that was pre-submitted. Um, what is the need for contact tracers? Is there, is there like a real number around how many we need in the United States? And how close do you think we are to, to meeting that need? We're not close. Um, and there are a lot of groups that are putting out numbers. Um, and in as far as I, understand, having talked to many of the groups that are putting out these numbers, they're going based on what we did in Massachusetts because Massachusetts is the only state to have a statewide cadre of contact tracers working directly with uh, the Department of Public Health. And we, as Sheila said, had almost 2,000 additional hires for 6 million people. And we know it's worked because the caseload is uh, dropping. We were down to, I think, 30 new cases yesterday, which is remarkable from, you know, thousands a day. Um, and we will soon be um, having perhaps a less of a large core here. Uh, in other places, there has been little that's been started. Uh, departments of public health are doing their best. They're overwhelmed. So, you know, you could use those rough estimates, and I think that's what people have done of about 2,000 per 6 million, or whatever, what, what uh, we can do the math on that. I think it's one per 50,000 or, or something like that. Um, but I think the issue is really to map the need for the community health workers and the contact tracers to the actual burden. And we know in some states, this is now exploding. So, um, you know, I think that's what we want to help with. And we do a lot, as Katie can tell you, of workforce planning based on what we've done in Massachusetts, based on what we know from Rwanda, from Liberia, Sierra Leone. 
Thank you. Uh, this next question, I think I'll, I'll send to Katie. Um, you know, a, a number of people I'm sure are, are just wondering how is the organization navigating political tensions and, and this pandemic? Um, you know, and I guess probably many of you could chime in on this one, it seems. We discussed it briefly too uh, previously. So Katie, how would you respond to, to that question? Yeah, I mean, a few things. I think, you know, part of um, what has called us into doing this work or why we're getting this outreach from so many states and cities across the U.S. is uh, the limitations of the national response in the U.S. Um, from the outset and the lack of a coordinated and sufficient early public health response um, that's left states and cities and communities in the driver's seat in many ways in terms of responding. Um, and so, you know, I think we're finding it important to name that and acknowledge that and accompany our, our, our state and city and community partners and connecting with one another and helping build those bridges as are many other organizations helping um, to, to kind of build those national bridges where we can. Um, I do think, you know, we are seeing um, with reopening and with kind of a, the economic crisis and suffering that, that is going on across the country, some um, backlash or pushback on public health efforts on these most critical um, pillars of, of epidemic response that we are seeing working in our home state of Massachusetts and as we've seen work in um, Korea and, and uh, Rwanda and, and other countries. Um, but I think, you know, we're finding it really important more than ever to continue to communicate um, uh, and to, to push messaging and community outreach, both sort of from a bottom up and a top down approach about kind of what is contact tracing? Why is it so important? Why is it a care coordination and care delivery exercise and not just a kind of surveillance exercise um, and to, to help combat misinformation that may be bubbling up um, and be filtered through kind of a political lens rather than through a public health lens. But we'd love to let other colleagues jump in on this one. Joy, did you want to add anything else to that? Just, uh, I thought you had some good comments too about specifically in Massachusetts. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we know from our work around the world that health is very, you know, needs leadership. And the best health programs in the world that have the least inequity, the governments that are able to respond are those that are well led and where leadership has the health of the population as a priority. And we're super grateful to live in Massachusetts uh, as, as, as all of us on the phone do because Governor Baker has been a great leader. He, he has put the needs of the people and the, you know, to, to try to chase down the very last case of COVID at the center of his agenda. And you know, we see that leadership from the top and that is what's needed. Um, and so, uh, and someone asks about the public health leaders. Absolutely. Uh, Commissioner Burrell was sidelined early in the epidemic because she, um, you know, got COVID herself and uh, was very public about that. But we've worked very closely uh, with the deputy director, with Secretary Sutter. So, so lots of great leadership in Massachusetts. And someone asked about Rwanda, and I would say again, from the top, very clear that it is the, the role of the president to enable his uh, health department, his health professionals to really take this on. And they've done an amazing job. Great. Thanks for covering that too, Joya, about Rwanda. I saw that, that question come through. Um, and of course, uh, at the same time that we're responding to the United States, all of our global work continues, right? We're also battling COVID in all of the 11 countries where, where, where we're working. So uh, that's important to note uh, that work has not stopped. Um, uh, this is for Monzi, actually. Um, I, there is a question here that came through. People want to know what resources are in a library. So once you get there, what, what types of things would people find? Uh, thanks for the question. So, you know, we, we have a number of resources. Again, it's a work in progress, but uh, the uh, tools we have vary from what do you need to consider in terms of workforce planning, so training of contact tracing. So what, what do you have to consider in terms of 
equity integration with the response? What do you have to consider with the data uh, management and what kind of uh, key performance indicators do you have to track? So really a number of, uh, you know, each of our pillars has some accompanying tools and we are sharing them. And, and obviously we understand that we will be uh, building this library as we go, but we don't want to wait until we have a very polished version to share what we have. So uh, we have uh, various materials and I hope you sign up and have access to all those tools. Great, thanks Monty. Um, and we have a couple questions actually about uh, what, what are we looking for in a good contact tracer? You know, what is the skill set that people need to have in order to be able to do this work effectively? Joy, I saw you nodding. Uh, maybe if you want to start. <laughs> I like that question. I mean, yeah, I, I can jump in, but I would welcome others too. We really want people who are empathic. Um, and I think we've heard a lot about tech, uh, tech enabled solutions. Um, but, you know, to thread in a few other questions that are on the thread, um, you know, people need to be empathic precisely because those who are most at risk for COVID are often from marginalized groups, are often living without the material means to ex effectively quarantine. And so we need people who have community knowledge, linguistic knowledge, cultural knowledge, so they can reach out to the most vulnerable. And so we can train people to on the technical part but we need that empathic ear and that human connection. And uh, that's, that's how we want to reach the most vulnerable. Anybody else want to add to that? I guess what, what makes a good contact tracer? Um, Katie, do you have uh, maybe some additions there? No, I mean, I think Joya hit the, the nail on the head. I think, you know, we've seen um, retired physicians be great contact tracers. We've seen out-of-work bartenders be great contact tracers. It's really about the ability to actively listen, empathetically communicate, um, understand your local context, and ideally be from the community that you're serving as a contact tracer. So you really have local community knowledge and context and language skills. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, we've really seen a broad profile be successful at the role and are trying to really share that experience with other states and cities, many of whom may have started with an assumption that you needed a master's in public health to do this work or that you had to set this really high credential bar. Um, and we do wanna leverage and take advantage of and, and honor all of the amazing experience and training our community health workers in, in states and cities across the US have and bring those um, experts into the fold as contact tracers wherever we can, but also acknowledge in this unprecedented moment that bringing in a range of other lay people and, and others who put their hands up to engage um, and join join the work um, can be successful at it. Great. Uh, one question I think is, is really interesting too, especially as we're talking about places reopening, right? And second waves and seeing a resurgence uh, of COVID. Um, is it realistic to continue contact tracing once states reopen um, and, and Sheila, you know, maybe that would be a good one for, for you to address uh, as well. I think it's a good question and gets to the heart of contact tracing. Yeah, actually, it's even more important that we continue to do contact tracing when we reopen because the, the goal is to stop transmission. So we know that um, just because the, the rules have changed and, and we're reopening um, does not necessarily mean that the virus has stopped at all. So contact tracing is going to be with us and should be with us for a long time as part of a comprehensive approach to stop the virus. So um, just as we've had contact tracing for years for other infectious disease, sexually transmitted infections, tuberculosis, other areas where it's important to reach out to other people, I think COVID-19 will be a piece of, of us for, for quite a while. And so now's the time to really invest in strong contact tracing programs as part of the public health response. Great. Uh, there's so many great questions here. So I, uh, I'm going to go through them as quickly as we can too. Another great one um, is, do the panelists see an opportunity for this effort to change the overall healthcare and public health systems in the US? in meaningful ways 
that deliver long-term reductions in inequities and improvements to health access? This is kind of the golden question right here. Uh, Joya, would you like to take a, a, an attempt at this one and happy to have anybody join in? Can you sum, just summarize the question again? I wanna make sure there were, seemed like two parts. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, do we see, oops, uh, I'm, I'm not muted, right guys? Okay, <laughs> just checking. Do you, uh, do, does anybody on the panel see um, this an opportunity for real systemic healthcare change, I think, and making a difference for people who face uh, yeah. systemic inequity? Yeah, so yeah, that's what I wanted to, so it is real, that's a, it's an excellent question, and I would just first of all say, you know, we're thankful to Sheila's leadership for sort of the nimbleness to jump into this fire because partners in health, we didn't need the business. <laughs> we were not looking necessarily to engage in this pandemic in, you know, in the United States. We were very, very concerned about the countries we serve around the world. Um, but we understand that there, there is, there are these important two things that you point out in that question. One is, it is an important time to look to the most vulnerable, and we see the, the protests for racial justice as part and parcel of the fight against COVID, that COVID is tracking along the fault lines of society. And so, yes, we think that the important point about contact tracing is care and also is mapping where the resources should go. Because if you know where it's spreading, uh, and we know it's in the poorest communities and overcrowded settings, uh, low wage workers, that then those places should be resourced. So it feeds into an advocacy agenda for food stamps, uh, unemployment benefits, and, and all of that in the short term. And then in the long term, absolutely, we are and have it on our uh, advocacy agenda to really look differently at how we provide healthcare in this country. I mean, for me as a physician who spent more than uh, you know my uh, generation, 25 years doing global health work, it's shocking to me the fragmented nature of the healthcare system. And um, we are really, we're here in the US, we're focusing on the hospitals and ventilators and nobody's doing the community approach. And in Africa, we're being told just do the community approach. That's the best you can do. Actually, you need both. You need both a strong health system to take care of the sick and a community system. And so we hope this is a wake up call um, and will help us all to think about what a comprehensive healthcare uh, system looks like in the United States and how we really need to fund uh, health and the social determinants or the social fat forces that lead to ill health uh, with an equity agenda. So both of those things are really why we agreed to be pulled into this fight. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and Sheila, this is a question that is uh, most uh, relevant to our Massachusetts work. So. Uh, do you have uh, data from the Massachusetts experience to say that our work is helping, right? How, how do you document that contact tracing is having an impact, if, if at all? You know, I think we, we look at the overall numbers of cases, and as, as Joy has said, the, you know, the numbers of new cases, of uh, numbers of deaths are coming down. Uh, that doesn't mean if there's a, another spike in cases, that doesn't mean that this isn't effective because this is contact tracing is a long-term uh, approach that, as I said earlier, has to be integrated into a long-term public health system just as it already is, but needs to add COVID-19 to this. So I think, you know, we're, the, the amount of, of people who are picking up the phone we know has increased as people are becoming more aware of what contact tracing is and the word is getting out. Um, we're working really closely with the community health centers, um, a number of them in Massachusetts, which has been phenomenal. They're the experts in that geographic area and in those neighborhoods. So they've uh, been able to take on contact tracing for that for their location as well as 
integrate and, and have people be um, uh, get regular primary care and be integrated into that health system as well. So I think we'll, you know, time will tell and we'll be able to look back. Our, our, we know that from the preliminary numbers that, that we're having an effect, we believe, from the overall, the way the epidemic is. Uh, but this is a, this is a, a, a marathon, not a sprint. So I, I think we'll be able to look back later and see maybe where, um, where we were most successful. But I think overall, we're feeling confident that this is, was definitely the right approach. And from the fact that so many other states have started doing this more aggressively, I think also uh, is showing that it's, it was worth the, the leap of faith to jump in and do this here in Massachusetts. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a, another question, Katie, I think maybe would be great for you to address. Uh, what does PIH do to make sure people have the resources to isolate, especially in places where resources are thin in the first place, right? So what are some of those things we're doing? I'm thinking of the care resource coordinators to make sure that people have what they need. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. You know, we've from day one in the work in Massachusetts, um, really insisted that care resource coordination isn't a nice to have, it's a must have as part of this process. And that, um, you know, it's essential to the effectiveness of the contact tracing and breaking chains of transmission, but there's also a moral imperative to ensure people are able to be referred to the supports and services that they need. Um, so in Massachusetts, we have a, a whole cohort of what we call uh, care resource coordinators who, when a contact calls and um, asks someone, you know, are you able to safely isolate at home or quarantine at home? And someone says no, um, that we are able to, to refer that person to this resource coordinator who can help um, get access to housing where people won't be in overcrowded conditions or put others at risk, can get access to food delivery to the home or referral for um, counseling or you know, domestic violence support. There's sort of across the range of needs that people may be experiencing. Um, this is often a, an acute on chronic challenge, meaning you know, there was already baseline um, vulnerability and challenges that people are facing at home and, and that COVID just exacerbates. And so this is such a critical moment to ensure that we're connecting people to the care and the resources they need. And that, you know, we feel, we feel strongly that, that that has to be a resourced staffed function within this process. Um, and so have been able to do that through these res care resource coordinators in mass, but are working with states and cities across the U.S. on who are who are um, piloting different models of that, you know, and as, as, as Monzi said, we really are learning so much from our peers. We're just a few weeks ahead in Massachusetts in sort of building this program, and there's all kinds of really exciting um, innovation going on around the country about different ways to, to build that in. In some cases, people are, um, the state is subgranting to local community-based organizations to help coordinate those services. Um, and others, they're um, funding local departments of health to hire existing staff to really reinforce that social work function that we know is so critical, not just for COVID um, resource coordination, but for any vulnerability or challenge that um, local health colleagues, local health department colleagues may need to refer um, their constituents on for. So um, yeah, couldn't say enough sort of how important this is and are also tracking in terms of effectiveness of programs. Um, you know, what percentage of folks are reporting they need support in order to be able to safely isolate and quarantine and then what percentage of those folks are actually accessing the services they need to ensure there's really follow through. And so I've been supporting our, our colleagues in yeah, states, cities, communities to ensure that's looked at at sort of the highest level of, of dashboard or metric that people are looking at um, in terms of measuring success and putting kind of the, the vulnerable at the center of, of how we're evaluating that as well. This is great. Um, and another question I think that maybe Joya, if you don't mind taking, um, you know, based on your world experience and for other people wondering where else we work, I know Hannah dropped a link in the chat to our countries where, where we work around the world so you can get more information. But based on our world experience, what are um, some elements of primary health that are being affected because of uh, COVID? Um, and, and we've seen this right in, in other uh, pandemics such as Ebola, but what areas of primary health are? I would like, yeah, I would like to turn that over to uh, Dr. Monzi uh, because he has been in close communication 
with our site teams around the world to try to look at the continuation of essential services. So, Monty, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. And uh, this is a great question. So, in terms of areas that are really affected, I would have probably started with, you know, uh, maternal, um, newborn, and child health services. And you know, and again, I, I can. It's a long list, but eventually, these are services that are normally, you know, critical and and very sensitive. So. Uh, we see a decline in utilization of maternal health services, especially uh, family planning. So, um, you know, most of these family planning services are really close in, in many countries. So, and that means that we should expect uh, sort of unwanted pregnancies moving forward. And we should be worried about really, you know, some mat increased maternal mortality in the coming years. Uh, obviously, you know, immunization, uh, nutrition services that are really closely related. So these are really services that are very, uh, very um, effective. So eventually we have some other in terms of infectious diseases and, and non-communicable diseases. We are lucky because uh, we, we have really a team of you know, critical thinkers who have been thinking about how do, to innovate and bringing really innovative solutions in our health system strengthening. So I can highlight Rwanda, for example, just you know, launched the use of drones to distribute medication um, during COVID. And, and Rwanda is also using um, you know, um, uh, robots to uh, you know, distribute and, and medications and, and, and and other services. So eventually, you know, back to health services that are affected and mainly we see issues in maternal health, in infectious, prevent, in infectious diseases, but also non-communicable diseases where people cannot afford to, you know, continue uh, the visits. Uh, it's not only the, you know, the, the, the disease areas, it's also some of the building blocks of the health system. So we see, an inconsistent um, you know, supply chain in, in many areas because some of the central warehouses are no longer open. The supply chain is not reliable this moment. And when you go to data and uh, when you go to really uh, the entire facility and systems, you see you know, many workers who are now in, in the lockdown, they cannot keep track on you know, health system strengthening. So eventually all health services are affected, but uh, we're really thankful for our teams that are very innovative in finding solutions and, and who, who use the learning uh, opportunities, the, this learning collaborative approach to always exchange tools that can help them to keep these uh, uh, programs and services running. Okay, that's great. Um, and one, one thing that I think I would piggyback to on, on that, Monzi, is um, that maybe you can help with. Many people are saying, how can I help? How can I get involved? And I'm thinking that maybe you, Monzi, and, and Katie could each talk about ways in which uh, folks on the line could participate um, in, in, in any way that that might seem uh, right in, in your space. So Monzi, maybe if you want to uh, speak first, and then on to Katie. Thanks. That's a great question, uh, Leslie. I think there are many ways to be involved in, and I think the first, I would say, engage. I think engaging means uh, we need all the implementers to all get together. So these stakeholders to come together, let's share and learn. So we, I think it is, we can build efficiency around the response and how do we do that? Let's get together and have a learning collaborative. We are launching one uh, next week. Uh, I mentioned the uh, June 23rd. So we want all the implementers to sign up, join us to share, to learn, but also to engineer solutions that could help us to contain the pandemic. So again, you know, with engaging, again, I would say we need the activists to stand up and say the, we cannot stop COVID if there's no equity agenda. 
So I, I think there's a role of the social civil uh, uh, society to play in here. Uh, and the other thing is really uh, helping people to understand and get the right information. Because I think it can be depressing to deal with a worse uh, and first information. So we need to make sure that we are, you know, going back in our community, disseminate this information that COVID is, is horrible, but it's something that we can stop if we act together. So um, again, you know, we need resources, you know, for sure we need to, you know, on behalf of my colleagues who are uh, in different areas, we need resources, masks, we need PPEs, uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, we, need, we need all the resources necessary for, for us and for our frontliners to really continue acting uh, in a safe way. So I think any ways to engage, to mobilize all these resources and efforts would be really a good way to be uh, uh, engaged and be part of this movement. Uh, maybe Katie can continue to expand the list. Well, I think Manzi nailed it. I feel like that's a great list. I feel like the, you know, join us. Um, we're in so many ways, you know, we're still recruiting for staff for the TA team. So if you have a background in this area and are interested, um, we're looking for project managers and project leads. Many states are still ramping up the recruiting for contact tracers. So encourage you to look out for those opportunities um, in your jurisdiction, state, city, community. Um, I think this push on sort of we're continuing to, to mobilize resources to fund our global COVID response and um, ongoing epidemic preparedness, but also to continue to complement the what the core TA work um, is doing with with some additional supports in the most vulnerable communities. Um, so welcome support in that realm. Um, and then really just to, to double down on Monzi's point about the kind of advocacy and movement building piece and kind of we really need everyone at the table there to support using um, ensuring that this moment doesn't pass us by in terms of really deep reflection and push for change on the limitations and the under-resourcing and the insufficiency and the inequity in our health systems in the U.S. and, and ensuring that we are coming out of this horrible crisis, um, hopefully with additional investments in community workforce and community health, paid community health workers in federally qualified health centers and primary care systems that, you know, take care of the, the poorest and most vulnerable and communities who have been historically um, marginalized, underinvested in, and discriminated against. Um, so we'll be working on building out some broader advocacy efforts that we'd love engagement on, um, you know, both in terms of our broader national work, but in local communities and hearing from you all about kind of where you, where you want to see um, us focus some of that effort and where the greatest needs are in your communities. Um, uh, yeah, we could, you know, this is, as Sheila said, a marathon, not a sprint. And um, while we're seeing really important traction and progress in Massachusetts and a number of other states, we've got a long fight ahead of us. Um, and so really appreciate the, the interest in supporting and engaging and joining us in this work. Great, thank you. Um, and I think maybe, you know, just looking at the time here, we'll take one more question. And this was actually pre-submitted. Um, it says, I'm, I'm curious what the potential spike in positive COVID-19 cases in cities uh, will be with recent protests. I'm interested in participating, but currently, uh, you know, hesitant because of a family member who, who is vulnerable uh, in my home. So um, anyone like to take that maybe? Uh, Joya, go ahead. I'll take that one. <laughs> I'll take that one. Um, you know, there is no fighting disease without fighting injustice. So it is the protests we consider to be extremely important. Um, that being said, everyone needs to make their personal decision. It is definitely true that with crowds, um, there will be COVID transmission, particularly in places where the spread has not been controlled. So. That being said, there are ways to protest safely. Um, the protests that are happening in Washington, D.C. have offered uh, for this weekend, have offered testing to people who are going in advance of the uh, protests. The ones that I was at a few weekends ago uh, were being very good about passing uh, hand sanitizer out. Um, everyone was wearing a mask. 
But I, I do think it's fair if you are immunocompromised or someone in your family is, or you have elderly folks at home or you yourself are older, I think it's, it's important to think about that. And there are other ways to support what's happening. But again, these diseases are not separate from the racial and justice inequities we have in the United States. And so uh, we consider this the same fight and, and certainly encourage people to seek justice and exercise their civil rights. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. We've had just an excellent conversation, so many wonderful questions, and I feel like I've learned a lot every single time I sit in on, on one of these chats. So uh, thank you to Sheila, Joya, Manzi, and Katie. Uh, thanks to everyone watching and listening. If you do want more information, please visit us at uh, pih.org. And if you're on social media, you can see uh, our work on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, pretty much anywhere that you're hanging out. And uh, again, thanks for your attention. If you can, please consider donating and uh, join us for the next uh, conversation in a couple of weeks. Have a great day, everybody.